Good evening. First off, I'd like to thank the elders and the congregation for this opportunity. The uh, point of this lesson is to teach the gospel truth. Uh, there, are, there may be things that some don't like in this sermon, but please know that the point of this, talk, uh, point of this is not to offend anyone, rather than the, the point is to show what the scripture has to say on the topic. As Americans, we have many freedoms. We have freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, freedom from unlawful search and seizures, freedom to bear arms, among many others. But um, are there any God-given rights? Um, our, uh, the preamble of our Declaration of Independence would seem to indicate that there are. Um, how should we, as Christians rather than Americans, utilize these? Um, these are some questions that I hope to answer uh, in this sermon. So my, ob my observations have led me to conclusion that some of the Christian Americans today seem to hold strong and dear to their quote-unquote God-given rights as Americans. I believe a lot of this comes from a misunderstanding and a misquoting of the Declaration of Independence. So the preamble states, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by the Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, I personally, I, I like that document, but I, we're going to answer some of the questions of if this is actually true based on Scripture. So what are God-given rights? They seem to be derived from the Declaration of Independence, at least the ones that I'll be focusing on tonight. Uh, while it's an important document, let's not forget that it's, it's a historical document. It's not even a legal document. The rights mentioned were heavily influenced by the writings of one John Locke in his Second Treatise of Government. And most importantly, it created by, uh, that document was created by man. It was not inspired by God. So those that love to recite this one phrase, God-given right to, I, I have heard so many different things. I have a God-given right to go to Walmart. No, you don't. I have a God-given right to drive on the left side of the road. No, you don't. I have a God-given right to drive anywhere without a driver's license. No, you don't. People love to say, I have a God-given right, and they don't have scripture to back it up most of the time. They hold so strongly to these perceived rights, that they actively commit sin in disobeying the gospel. Let that set in and marinate for a moment, people. People believe so much that these quote-unquote God-given rights exist that they actively, actively ignore or violate the laws of God, the laws that God has given us through Scripture. Brothers and sisters, we cannot be one of these people. God has given us a government. Uh, hold on, let's see. I'm, I'm, I forgot to click. Sorry about that. God has given us a government, which for all its faults, I still think is one of the best ones in the current world. Through this government, we do have some rights that have been handed down by man. We have... We have to obey this government even if we don't necessarily like who's in charge. We can see this in Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. Turn with me there, please. Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. Apparently, that's the one verse I did not put in my uh, scriptures up here. Romans 13, 1 through 7. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities 
resist what God has appointed. And those that resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath of the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes you, uh, for the authorities and our ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. In these verses, we can see that we are to be subject to our own government and pay respect to it and pay our taxes. We don't see Paul badmouthing Caesar. Neither should we badmouth our president, regardless of if the one you voted for won or not. It doesn't matter. God appointed him. I want to make sure everyone hears that. God appointed him. Doesn't matter who he is. Republican, Democrat, Independent, does not matter. Respect your leaders. And uh, this is where people may not like what I have to say, but likewise, if we were under a dictatorship, which I am thankful we are not, but if we were, guess what? We have to obey those leaders too. We have to obey the laws of our land as long as they don't go against God's law. So, that was my little soapbox for the evening. I'll step off of that now. So let's get back to what are these uh, supposed God-given rights? What about the pursuit of happiness? Now, you can get into debates on what pursuit of happiness means, but since the preamble was largely based off the writing from John Locke, most scholars tend to agree that it is land ownership. Do we see that in the scripture? No, it's not there. Doesn't matter if you own land or not. Okay, what about liberty? Is that in there? Quite the opposite. As servitude is mentioned quite often, and we are either slaves to Christ or slaves of sin. That's our choice. We are going to be slaves one way or the other. One way leads to eternal damnation. The other way leads to eternal salvation. We can see this in Romans 6, 16. Romans chapter 6, verse 16. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? So... We're slaves one way or the other. Liberty is not guaranteed. Okay, what about life? Surely, surely life is there, right? No, it's not. In fact, many lose their life in preaching the gospel. John the Baptist in Matthew 14, Matthew chapter 14, verses 10 through 11. Let's read that real quick. It's only uh, two verses. Matthew 14, 10 through 11. He sent and had John beheaded in prison. And his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl, and she brought it to her mother. John was beheaded because he had said things that people didn't like. Stephen, Acts chapter 7, verses 58 through 60. Acts chapter 7, verses 58 through 60. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. 
And when he had said, and when he had said this, he fell asleep. Let's be clear here. When he fell asleep, he died a physical death. James, in Acts chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. Acts 12, verses 1 through 2. About that time, Herod, the king, laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. Let's not forget the most important one of all, Jesus, our Savior. He died one of the most crucial, one of the most painful deaths you can imagine. He was scourged, he was mocked, he was beaten, then he was hung on a cross to die. You can see this throughout the chapter of Mark, Matthew 27, Mark 15, Luke 23, John 19, numerous places throughout the Bible. All right, so there's no guarantee for the pursuit of happiness or land ownership. There's no guarantee for, the, uh, for liberty. There's no guarantee of life. And let me be clear here. I'm comparing apples to apples here. I'm talking about physical life, okay? If we obey Jesus, we do have eternal spiritual life. But I don't think that's what the preamble there was talking about. I don't think he was talking about spiritual life. It was talking about physical life. So just so we're on the same page there. What about uh, all men are created equal? This happens to be one that, got, uh, that uh, the preamble got right. We are all equal once we put on Christ. He is the great equalizer. Let's turn to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male or female, for, all, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Let's also uh, reinforce, let, reinforce that. Let's go to James chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. James chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. So, yes, that is one God-given right that it got right. But this is also possibly one of the hardest for anyone to understand. Well, it's easy to say. It's not as easy to follow through and do. And this has been a problem since the beginning. It's not just us as Americans. It's not just people in Russia. It's not just people in China. It's not people in Mexico. This has been a problem since the beginning. And we can see this with Peter. Turn with me to Acts chapter 10, beginning in verse 10. Acts 10, beginning in verse 10. And he, referring to Peter, became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance. And he saw the heavens opened up and something like a great sheet descending being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came to, came to him a voice saying, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him a second time. What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times. And the thing was taken up at once to heaven. So we're going to skip down to verses 34 and uh, following there. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality. 
but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. So Peter, Peter was a Jew. This was referring to Gentiles. Jews had a big problem with Gentiles. Who were Gentiles? Guess what? We're Gentiles. Unless you're of Jewish descent, you're a Gentile. The Jews had the old law. They were God's chosen people. So when Jesus came along and brought forth the new law, things changed. It was no longer just Jews that had access to the salvation of God. It was now open to anyone who would, would obey God. And some of the Jews who were Christians had a problem with this. Peter had a problem with this initially. It took a vision from God to get him to understand that, hey, this is a good thing. All right, so we've covered uh, the rights and freedoms discussed in the um, preamble. What about earthly rights? Do we have any? If so, what did the Scripture say about them? Well, we do have earthly rights, and these are just fine. There's nothing wrong with having a right, as long as we, what we do with those rights and freedoms doesn't impair the spreading of the gospel or otherwise go against God's word. The Apostle Paul was a Roman citizen by birth. You can see this in Acts chapter uh, 22, verse 28. There it reads in Acts chapter 22, verse 28. The tribune answered, I bought this citizenship, referring to a Roman citizenship. I bought this citizenship for a large sum. But Paul said, but I am a citizen by birth. So we can see that Paul admitted that he was a citizen of Rome. And with that came certain privileges, certain rights. Paul was not afraid to use his rights as a Roman citizen when it was expedient to do so in the spreading of the gospel. He had a right to a trial. Let's look at Acts chapter 16, verse 37. <clears throat> there it says, But Paul said to them, They have beaten us publicly, uncondemned men, who are Roman citizens and have thrown us into the prison. And do they now throw us out secretly? No. Let them come out themselves and take us out. Let's go ahead and read a little bit further there. I meant to include another verse. The police reported these words to the magistrates. And they were afraid when they had heard that they were Roman citizens. So they came out and apologized to them. And they took them out and asked them to leave the city. So, that when it, so they went out of the prison and visited Lydia. And when they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them and departed. That does not say right to a trial, and I apologize. Freedom from unjust punishment, Acts twenty two twenty five. But when they had stretched him out for the whips, Paul said to the centurion who was standing by, Is it lawful for you to flog a man who is a Roman citizen and uncondemned? When the centurion had heard this, he went to the tribune and said to him, What are you about to do? For this man is a Roman citizen. So the tribune came and said to him, Tell me, are you a Roman citizen? And he said, Yes. The tribune answered, As we've already read, I bought this citizenship for a large sum, but Paul said, I am one by birth. Paul had a right to appeal to Caesar. Staying in Acts, let's go to uh, verse 25. Acts chapter 25, verses 10 through 11. But Paul said, I am standing before Caesar's tribunal when I ought to be tried. To the Jews, I have done no wrong, as you yourself know very well. 
If then I am a wrongdoer and have committed anything for which I deserve to die, I do not seek to escape death. But if there is nothing to their charges against me, no one can give me up to them. I appeal to Caesar. So he had a right to appeal to Caesar. So we can see Paul was not afraid to use his rights when it served the gospel. He's also not afraid to waive those rights when it served the gospel. Paul was stoned in Lystra, Acts 14, verse 19. Acts 14, verse 19. But the Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. Did he exercise his freedom from unjust punishment there? No. Why? Looking uh, at verses 20 through 22. But when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city, and on the next day he went on, to, uh, went on with Barnabas to Derbe. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and, and Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. I'm not saying Paul enjoyed being stoned. I don't think that's the point of this scripture. I'm saying he did what was necessary, whether that was exercising his rights or waiving them to spread the gospel. And so must we. Not only was he stoned in Lystra, there was an assassination attempt at uh, Damascus. Did Paul exercise his rights to alert the Roman authorities about uh, his assassination, the assassination attempt on him? No. Acts chapter 9, verses 23 through 25. When many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him, but their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him. But his disciples took him by night and led him down through an opening in the wall and lowering him in a basket. Did he go to centurions? Did he go to a magistrate? Did he go to the ruler of that land? No. Now, personally, I think that's because he knew that he had other places to be. It wasn't his time to go through the trial. It wasn't his time to get over to Rome. All right, so we've covered some uh, earthly rights. What about some God-given freedoms? Yeah, we have those. We have the freedom to eat all types of food. We can see this uh, in the verse that we are uh, passages that we've already read about Peter. Uh, but we can also look at uh, Acts chapter ten, verses nine through sixteen. Acts 10, verses 9 through 16. The next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop in about the sixth hour to pray, and he became hungry, wanted to, something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance. We've already read this. But we're going to read it again, because it applies here. And saw the heavens opened, and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came to him boy, a voice, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. The voice came to him again a second time. What God has made unclean do not call common. This happened three times. The thing was taken up to heaven at once. We have freedom to, uh, of opinions. Paul and Barnabas had different opinions about Mark. In Acts chapter 15, verses 36 through 40. Acts chapter 15, verses 36 through 40. And after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Now Barnabas wanted to take them uh, with them. John called Mark. But Paul thought best to 
take with them one who had not uh, one who had withdrawn from them in uh, Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement, so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. Paul chose Silas and departed, having been com- uh, commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. We have freedom from sin if we obey the gospel. Romans chapter 6, 16 through 18. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. It's a binary decision. People love to argue. I love to argue. You can ask Melanie. You can ask my mom. But there's nothing to argue here. There is one choice. You either follow God or you don't. There is no in-between. There is no... Gray area, it is a binary decision. It is yes or no. There is no neutral on that. But we do have rights. We are also commanded not to use them if they cause another to stumble. We are never to use them to cause others to sin. Turn with me to Romans 14, 13 through 23. Romans chapter 14, verses 13 through 23. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it unclean. For your brother is grieved by what you eat. You are no no longer walking in love. But what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. So do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then let us pursue what makes for peace and mutual upbringing, upbuilding. Do not for the sake of food destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. If it is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble, the fate that you have, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. But whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats, because the eating is not from the faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. So, the too long didn't read? Don't use your rights to call somebody to stumble. Don't eat meat if it offends the conscience of another. Now, we all live in the South. Most of us like barbecue. There may be some vegetarians among us. I feel sorry for you. Bacon's tasty. But if it was a matter of faith, if you thought me eating some barbecue pork or some bacon or turkey or whatever, beef brisket, if that offended you, if you thought that was a sin, guess what? I don't need to do that in front of you. I need to pass up that right. I need to pass up that freedom. Because it's not about me. It's about helping my brother get to heaven. We saw that there is freedom of opinions. Paul and Barnabas. But don't quarrel over your opinions. Staying in uh, Romans chapter 14. Going to uh, verse 1. As for the one who is weak in faith... Welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. 
I mean, it literally says it right there in one sentence. Don't quarrel over opinions. Don't do it. It's not worth it. Don't do anything that's going to cause your brother to stumble. Romans 14, 20 through 21. We've already read that, so we're not going to read it again for sake of time. So, conclusion. We do have rights that are endowed by our Creator, endowed by our Creator. And we have rights that are endowed by man. Just because we have certain rights does not mean that we should exercise them at all times. Paul was an excellent example of this. We should only exercise them only if they do not cause another brother to stumble. They further the cause of Christ. Why? While we're American citizens, that comes with a lot of rights. And I'm glad I'm an American citizen. I don't want to be a citizen somewhere else. I'm not trying to disparage any other country or any other brethren that may be listening from another country. I like where I live. But while I am an American citizen, while most of us here are American citizens, more importantly, we are God's, hopefully we are all citizens of God's kingdom through Christ. This, this is the most important citizenship we can ever have. It doesn't matter at the end of the day when we make it to heaven, if I was an American, if I was a Russian, if I was Czechoslovakian, if I was Japanese, Chinese, Mexican, Honduras, it doesn't matter. Because this is all temporary. This is all fleeting. What matters is that we're right in the sight of God and that we're members of his kingdom. That's the important citizenship. So, is there any easy way to remember when not to use your rights? I certainly think there are. Well, I was hoping not all three would come up at the same time, but the first one is, it's not about you. At the end of the day, it's not about you. That, that's it. That, that's the easiest way to remember. Just because I could open carry a 50 caliber sniper rifle into this auditorium doesn't mean I should. Is that going to further the cause of the gospel? No, that's probably going to scare people away. Let's not do that, people. And thank you all for not doing that. But it is about God. We put God first. We always put God first. You put God first, everything else starts falling into place. After God, you put others. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you can do these three things, remember that it's not about you but that it is about God and that you put others above yourself, that's going to be three easy things to remember when to use your rights. So I'd like to leave you with the passage that we read the, uh, at the beginning this evening. Philippians 3, verses 17 through 21. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you, and now tell you, even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame, with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship, those that have obeyed Christ, our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject, subject all things to himself. This has not been necessarily a sermon to teach someone the gospel. This is more of a reminder of those for us that are all, have already obeyed. But with that being said, I never want to not give an opportunity for those that are among us that may want to obey the gospel or have fallen away and you want to make things right, please take this opportunity to come forward while we stand and sing.